I want to welcome our first speaker, um, Dr. Amanda Weber is a pediatric epileptologist uh, at Children's Hospital of Michigan, and she is going to talk about appropriate epilepsy care from diagnosis to treatment. Good morning, Dr. Weber. Okay, so let's... Everybody, thanks so much for coming today. Um, today we're going to talk about different uh, pieces of epilepsy care, so everything from diagnosis to treatment. We'll touch a little bit on the definition of epilepsy, and hopefully this will be a review for most of you. And then different diagnostic tools that we use. What do our tests mean? Um, what do we get out of them? A little better. Um, when should you think about getting a second opinion or seeing an epileptologist? Who else might be involved in your care? Which other providers may be involved? Um, how do we choose our medications and how do we change them? And what are some alternative treatment options when medications don't work? And the last thing that we'll touch on are, are barriers to care. So starting with seizures and epilepsy, epilepsy is an umbrella term. It's, it doesn't tell us why somebody has seizures, it just tells us that somebody's at risk to have seizures. And so this is a clinical diagnosis that we make after somebody has had two or more unprovoked seizures. And when I say unprovoked seizures, I mean seizures that don't come because a child has a fever and they have a febrile seizure, or it doesn't come after a major head injury, they just come um, out of the blue unprovoked. The other times that we make this definition are if somebody has one unprovoked seizure, plus our tests tell us, or something else about the clinical history tell us, that that person may have a risk for ongoing seizures. The third time that we make that diagnosis is if somebody has a specific epilepsy syndrome. So epilepsy is not, is not uncommon. About 1 in 26 people during their life will develop epilepsy at some point. And as we know, about 300,000 American children under 14 years of age have epilepsy. When we talk about epilepsy, we're not just talking about seizures. So there are so many other things, as many of you guys know, that go along with seizures. There are mood problems. We have a much higher risk for things like depression, anxiety, um, suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. Um, we, have, we can have a whole variety of developmental problems, school problems, ADHD, learning problems. And so when we're talking about epilepsy care, we have to talk about how to address each of those things. Um, and I think today's conference will, look, will really give you guys some insight about how to manage those things. So what to expect during your first few visits. You guys are, have probably been through all of this before, but we'll just um, quickly discuss. The questions that we're trying to answer with all of the history that we're taking, with these extensive exams, with all of these tests that we're ordering, we're trying to answer the question, what is happening to your child? Are they seizures or are they something else? There are a lot of seizure mimics, and sometimes it's hard to sort out what's actually happening. We'll try to answer the question, why is this happening? So what is the etiology? Um, why is your child having seizures? And we'll try to answer the question for you, how likely is it that if your child has had one seizure that it'll happen again? Um, and, and we'll try to answer some prognostic questions. If they do have seizures now, how likely is it that they'll outgrow those seizures? Um, and then, then the other questions that we'll start talking about, how do we treat your child? How do we best treat your child? And that's a discussion that, that we have to have together. There's not one right answer. So starting with the history, the things that, that are really important to us, we'll want to know about birth history, early developmental milestones. and so. Um, bringing as much information as you can to those visits is important. Knowing about other medical problems, past surgeries, other risk factors for epilepsy like prior traumatic brain injuries, infections, meningitis, encephalitis, other medications that the patient may be on, um, family history, and a lot of times people don't know a whole lot about their extended family history. So try to ask those questions in advance and bring that information to the visit if you can, so that, um, so that we can all work together to try to figure out if that puts your child at risk to have seizures. And then school and social factors, we're going to keep asking about it every visit because that's so important um, in epilepsy care. So other things that we'll want to know about, we'll want to know 
if your child had this seizure-like event, what happened? What did it look like? So if you weren't there, if you didn't witness it, try to get some information from someone who did. If you can take videos of events that are happening, that's really helpful too. Sometimes we can pick up on things that, um, that in the panic of the moment you don't necessarily see. Um, we'll also ask about preceding events. So what triggered this? Was your child up the whole night, um, the night before at a birthday party or something like that, and then they had a seizure the next day? Sleep deprivation can be a really important trigger. Did they have any aura? So that helps tell us where maybe in the brain the seizure may have started. And then we'll want to know other event details. Was there focality? Did it start on one side of the body? Um, what were other features if they went to an ER? A lot of times um, we don't have that information, especially if the hospital system is different than, than the provider that you're going to. We don't have the information about what lab tests did they draw, what CT scans, and so if you can get that information ahead of time or we'll request the records to get that information from, um, from the outside hospital, that can be helpful. And then what happened after the seizure? So the neurological exam, um, we focus on development, learning and speech skills, coordination, skin findings can be important to help tell us about genetic risk factors for seizures. And then our tests. So the most common tests, EEGs and MRIs, and the goal behind doing these tests is to try to determine two things, the seizure type and the etiology. Why did these seizures happen? So the EEG, you guys have probably all had a lot of experience with this. These, um, this is a picture of a little baby getting an EEG. Basically, during an EEG, they, um, the technicians attach small electrodes to the scalp, and the purpose of this test is to look at the electrical activity in the brain. And so this um, may show us a risk for seizures or a difference in function from one part of the brain to the other. So if you can see, I don't know which screen to point to, but I guess this one. You can see um, here the red. That's the left side of the brain in this picture. The blue is the right side of the brain. And these two should look approximately equal. If one side is a lot slower than the other, if one side has a different size waveforms, then that may tell us that that side of the brain is not functioning right for some reason. So that can give us insight if there is a structural lesion or if there's a problem with a portion of the brain. And the other thing that we can see is right now this EEG looks pretty normal. So you can see pretty smooth, flat waves. Sometimes we see spikes or we see spike and slow waves, and that tells us that, um, that the brain is at risk to have seizures, so it's showing irritability. A lot of people have come to the office and they were afraid that the EEG um, during the test, the brain is actually getting electric shocks or things like that. That doesn't happen, I just want to clarify that. This is a recording test, we just record information. And so this is an example of an EEG that's showing an absence seizure. Um, and so this, this just shows you that you have these nice smooth waves to the left, and then all of a sudden you have a very clear disruption and you have what we call three hertz spike wave activity. You may have heard that before. All that means is that there are sharp waves followed by slow waves, and they happen about three times per second, okay? So this is what an absence seizure looks like on the EEG. And so I'm just gonna use this as an example to show you what is a generalized seizure looking like. The generalized seizure, the disruption in the background starts in the whole brain at once. It starts diffusely. Whereas a more focal seizure, we might see in just one part of the brain. And so that's how we use the EEG to kind of distinguish where is the seizure most likely coming from? What type of seizure is it? Um, and, and so this EEG can help us characterize events. So if your child is having staring spells, we don't know, is this behavioral? Is this absent seizures? Is this a focal seizure? Capturing these on EEG can help give us that insight. Um, some people with epilepsy have normal EEGs. Some people without epilepsy, without seizures, have abnormal EEGs. So we have to interpret these a little bit. Um, and an EEG is just a snapshot in time that tells us what is, the what is the electrical activity in your brain doing right now during this test. So it can change over time. Um, I know that that sometimes leads to confusion too, but they can change over time, they can be normal. Even a normal EEG does not mean that your child is not having seizures. EEGs, typically a routine EEG is about 20 minutes. Um, sometimes we use longer recording periods to try to capture, capture spells and characterize them. Sometimes it's important to look at sleep to see what is the brainwave activity during, doing during sleep. Um, and so sometimes these can, these can be 
overnight, 24 hours. Sometimes we even keep people out longer, three to five days, to try to really capture multiple seizures. So a brain MRI, uh, this is a picture, okay? So whereas the other one, the EEG, looked at the electrical activity, the brain MRI is important, and we need both of these because the brain MRI shows us about the structure of the brain. And so here is a normal brain MRI, and you can see detailed information about the structure of the brain, the symmetry from right to left side. Um, and so with the brain MRI, we look for things like um, masses, scars, um, old strokes, things like that, that can help give us information about if your child is having seizures, why are they having seizures? Um, so this is a picture that's created by magnets, and so there's no radiation exposure, so that's an advantage. Um, but it does take an hour or two to get these good images, and the person has to lie completely still. And so that's not always possible for little kids. So usually eight and under, we have to use either sedation or general anesthesia, and even teenagers, even some adults still need sedation. So, um, so there are potential risks associated with that. Um, but this really gives us a good picture of the brain and helps give us different information than the EEG does, so both are very important. A head CT, um, we try to avoid these if possible, but we do these in emergency situations. So as you can see, the picture here is a little bit less clear than the MRI. So the MRI showed us a lot more detail than the CT does. Um, the CT is really good at looking at the bones, it's, looking, it's really good at looking for blood products in the brain. It's good at looking for swelling or increased pressure in the brain. But it doesn't give us that great definition that the MRI does of all the folds of the brain. Um, and so it's less, it's less detailed. There is radiation exposure. One advantage, though, is you typically don't need sedation. It's a really quick test. It can be done in, in a matter of a couple of minutes. And so we do use these in emergency situations sometimes. So other things, after your tests have been ordered, after we take the history and do the physical exam, we want to prepare you for how to deal with seizures in the future. So we want to talk about first aid safety tips, we want to give you handouts about what to do, um, we want to help educate you and whoever's caring for your child about what next steps to take if your child has another seizure. And so to help prepare you, we usually come up with an emergency plan, and part of that um, maybe may involve a seizure action plan, um, part of that may involve abortive medications, things like rectal diastat or things like that, depending on what type of seizure your child has. We also want to educate you on what do different seizures look like. Not all seizures look the same, and, um, and sometimes people don't realize that things that are happening actually may be little seizures, so that's important too. Um, we want you to know what to do during the next event, and it's really important in your first few visits, establish a good way to communicate because that is a huge barrier to care. Um, you know, so often I hear people say, we've tried calling the office, no one's calling us back, how can we get a hold of you? And so really establishing a good phone number early, um, working with the patient portal system, if your hospital system has that is really important so that you can email back and forth, figure out a good way to communicate with your doctor, get to know the nurse in the practice, because a lot of times they're your first line um, source of information. This is just an example of a handout you may receive about seizure first aid. Um, you know, the main things being, will the person on their side, don't put anything on their mouth, or inside of their mouth, don't hold them down, loosen any tight clothing. Um, and so these handouts like this you could take to the child's school, or daycare provider to help train them too. Um, in a seizure action plan, you can download these online. Many schools have these and have their own individualized um, versions of these. But in a seizure action plan, what should be there is a description of what does your child's seizure look like, what can trigger the child's seizures, what are their daily medications and dosages, um, and what kind of first aid plan do you have. Do, does your child need an abortive medication? So these are important to keep updated so that if something happens and you're not there to be able to provide the information, somebody knows more information about your child's care. There are a lot of different examples of rescue medications that we use. There's rectal diastat. This is the picture here. Um, there's intranasal versed um, or midazolam. This one was recently FDA approved. And then there's an oral dissolving um, clonazepam wafer that we sometimes use as well. 
So common seizure types, you guys probably know a lot of this by now, but generalized tonic-clonic is kind of the classic seizure that everybody thinks of, where there's a full body convulsion, full body jerking, um, typically ends by three minutes on its own without intervention. Um, generalized absent seizures are the staring seizures where somebody stares off, they may blink, it usually interrupts their, their speaking. These are typically really short, three to five seconds, maybe a little bit longer, but typically very short, and the, and the child picks up right afterwards where they were. Um, focal onset seizures, so you can also have staring seizures that are focal. Those tend to be longer. Um, they tend to be more associated with confusion. Sometimes there's abnormal speech with them, um, abnormal movements, um, and, and there is an impaired awareness during those as well. And then there can also be seizures that are focal, but they have retained awareness, so they can still talk during them. They can still interact during those seizures. They may be just jerking of one limb. They may be just sensory symptoms in one part of the body. Other seizure types, atonic seizures, drop attacks. Um, so this is where a child suddenly collapses. Um, and in these cases, having safety equipment like a helmet, different things like that can be, can be really important. Tonic seizures involve full body stiffening without that clonic jerking. And then myoclonic seizures are sudden brief jerks of the body. Really quick. Are those, are those more common at night? Like, are they more common at night? Which seizures? The myoclonic? So usually, my, well, it depends on the epilepsy syndrome, but for example, in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, morning is your classic time to have them. When you first wake, but in general, the transition from sleep to wake and wake to sleep is the time that your brain is most vulnerable to have seizures. So depending on the type of seizure that your child may have, um, you know, that can vary a little bit. But a lot of people, the, the timing is that transition from wake to sleep and sleep to wake, or early morning with myoclonic seizures, for example, in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So now that we've talked about how to diagnose seizures, um, how our emergency action strategies, now we, we can talk about preventative treatment options. So this is a graph of, um, of FDA-approved medications. And as you can see, after 1990, we've had a huge uptick in the um, number of available medications that we have to use. Uh, so now we have about 30 different approved options for the treatment of seizures. So how do we choose which one? So our goals for epilepsy treatment are always no seizures, no side effects. We don't always achieve that, but that's always our goal, no seizures, no side effects. We always try to use the minimal number of medications if possible and the lowest possible effective doses. We base our initial choices usually on seizure type. So if we know that that child has focal seizures, then that will that often pushes us more to use a focal medication initially. Um, broad spectrum medications are available for multiple seizure types um, or for generalized onset seizures. Sometimes the specific seizure type dictates which medications are best. We know this based on, um, on evidence-based trials. So for example, infantile spasms, the three gold standard medications are ACTH, bigabitrin, and, and prednisolone. Those are very seldom used in other cases, um, but those are first line for infantile spasms. For absent seizures, there's been a head-to-head -head trial comparing ethosuximide, valproic acid, and lamotrigine, and typically those are our first line choices for absent seizures. Um, so when we're looking for the right medication, we take into account the seizure type, but we also have to look at the other, other issues that are going on with your child. So the side effect profile. If your child's on other medication, we have to take into account medication interactions. We have to look into organ system considerations. If your child has a history of kidney stones, for example, we'd want to avoid something like Topamax. Um, if your child is a girl um, who's a teenager and could potentially, you know, may potentially be thinking about starting a family someday, then we may want to avoid the medications that have the higher risk for birth defects um, in case she's on that medication long term. We also can kind of use some of the medication properties to our advantage. So a lot of people with epilepsy also have migraines. And so in those cases, we can choose things like topiramate or valproic acid, um, which can be helpful to prevent migraine headaches and can also be helpful for the treatment of, of the seizures. 
Um, same thing with mood disorders. There are some medications that um, are more mood stabilizing. Lamictal tends to be more of, or Lamotrigine or Lamictal tends to be more mood elevating. Not in everybody, but um, but they can be. Um, Velproic acid, oxcarbazepine are other examples of medications that even when people don't have epilepsy, they're sometimes used to help with mood disorders. And so those may be considerations in those cases. Um, and then ticks is another example. Sometimes we use seizure medications off-label for ticks. So if your child also has ticks, then we may choose one of these from that get-go. The other thing that we have to take into account is the frequency of dosing. We know from studies that the more often a medication has to be dosed, the more likely you are to miss medications. It's, it's human nature, it's life. Um, and so if we can dose a medication once a day, that's usually preferable to three times a day. Um, you know, and then if your child can't take a pill yet, then we have to take that into account. Um, and then also need for lab monitoring. You know, we always try to start with medications that don't require frequent lab monitoring because it's uncomfortable, it's not convenient, um, it requires a lot of, a lot of um, extra steps. So every medication has a recommended dose range based on your child's weight. I, I know a lot of people come in and, and say it feels like, you know, like we're just experimenting here. Why do we have to keep increasing the medication? But what we try to do is we try to minimize side effects. And so we always try to start at the lowest possible effective dose, the lowest dose that we think may work for your child. So it, with the example of levetiracetam or Keppra, if your child weighs 36 pounds, then the dosage range is broad. 160 to about 500 milligrams twice a day. So we always start, try to start on the low end. Um, we start low, we go slow, we try to minimize side effects, and then if your child has breakthrough seizures, then we try to escalate it. So I always encourage parents to call me with every breakthrough seizure initially. I wanna know about every breakthrough seizure so that if possible, we can increase each time um, and try to get those controlled as long as the child isn't missing medications or there isn't other, some other provoking factor. So when do we change medications? If there are intolerable side effects, definitely. Um, and that is determined by you, what is intolerable. Every medication has the potential for side effects, and so, um, so we need your feedback about what is not working for your family, what is okay, what is not working. Um, if a medication is not effective, then we change it, and if the medication can't be given as instructed. So some, some babies spit out a certain medicine every time they take it, so then you have to talk to the pharmacist about can they flavor it differently. You know, Sometimes we have to switch the medication if they're just not able to get it. So other topics to expect at follow-up visits, we'll want to know about seizure frequency, how often is your child continuing to have seizures, what types of seizures, how long are they lasting, has your child been to the emergency room, what kind of triggers have you identified and how can we avoid those things, um, and then medication compliance and side effects. Uh, and, and logs of these things can help, so you're going to remember um, it's going to be really hard to remember six months from today what you did today and what happened today. And so keeping logs of things can be really help, really helpful. And videos can help, too, of what seizures look like and things like that. Um, expect to discuss test results. And you guys can ask to see what does the MRI look like? What are the findings? What does the EEG look like? Just so that you have an idea um, of what we're seeing. And I would encourage you to keep a folder with your results. Um, so. People move, people go on vacation, people, you know, and so having a folder that's all ready to go that has a list of prior test results, that has a list of current medications, your seizure action plan can be really helpful if you're in Florida on vacation and your child has a seizure and you end up in the emergency room there. Um, it, it's going to be really helpful for the other providers to know what else has been done. Um, or if you go for a second opinion, having all that stuff ready to go is, is really helpful. Um, You'll want to review your emergency plan, ask any questions, and safety topics are really important too. So talking about what are the driving laws, is your child able to drive, um, you know, if they're safe to get a job, water safety is really important, this is the time of year for that. So thinking about, um, you know, drowning risks, when can your, when can your child um, uh, swim on their own, um, you know, showers being safer than bathtubs things like that, and then helmets always from riding bikes. 
So there are specific things that we focus on at subsequent epilepsy visits based on your child's age, behavior, before school age, we think a lot about developmental milestones and how we can help your child if they're not properly meeting their milestones. And so, um, you know, if therapies are needed, then we prescribe those. And we also try to educate you about early childhood programs that are available. So for kids under three, early on is a really important resource. Um, it's provided through the school system and they can help set your child up with the therapies that he or she may need. Um, early childhood special education is for the kids who have graduated out of that early on program. And it's a school program where they can get socialization, but they can also get their therapies right there as well. Um, so those are, those are helpful. Once a child is more of the school age, um, then we start talking about school performance, inattention. Does that child have any of these other comorbid um, conditions that often go along with epilepsy? Do they need treatment for ADHD? Um, is there a suspicion for a learning disorder and how can we better approach that? How can we diagnose that? How can we get the school involved um, to help with those things? Is mood a big issue and how can we, how can we help with that? Um, and so that's where things like individualized education plans come up, 504 plans, seizure action plans for school and daycare come up, um, school safety things to discuss, and then if they need ongoing therapies. Once kids get more to the teenage years, then we start to try to talk about some transition topics. So increasing independence. How can we get your teenager to remember to take their medicine? And so, you know, things like setting um, alarms on phones, reminders, things like that. Hormonal influence of things. So does your child have breakthrough seizures every time um, her period is about to start? Um, talking about things like that is important. Pregnancy planning. A lot of girls wonder, can I get pregnant? Will my pregnancy be healthy? You know, they start thinking about these things in their teenage years, um, and so just starting that conversation is important. A lot of times we recommend folic acid supplementation for girls of childbearing age, um, so teenage girls, um, who are on seizure medications because folic acid can prevent neural tube defects um, in some cases, and, and so that's something that we at least like to start talking about in the teenage years. And then the effects of drugs and alcohol. Um, so alcohol can definitely increase the risk for breakthrough seizures. And so talking to kids early about that is really important. And then mood and behavior is always an important thing to follow, risk for um, suicidal thoughts, things like that. Um, driving is always a popular topic, typically. Um, and so knowing the driving laws, um, and, and how that pertains to your child, how that applies to your child is important. And then long-term planning. So this is where we often involve other people in the visit, people like social workers, people like care coordinators, um, to help with transition topics, thinking about when to transition to the adult world, to an adult epileptologist, um, you know, if guardianship is an issue, how to start that process, um, and then other continued school options. Um, for kids up to 26 years of age if they qualify, and then what kind of therapies do they need. So there's a whole list of other people who may be involved in your child's care, and that's because there are so many other things that can go along with epilepsy. So neuropsychologists are very important. They can help us diagnose ADHD, learning disorders. They can help us in children who are um, surgical candidates to help localize um, certain parts of the brain that maybe aren't working quite right, and that can help tell us information about maybe where the seizures are coming from. Um, psychologists can be really helpful for counseling um, in kids who have mood problems or, or other issues like that. Psychiatrists are doctors that prescribe medications for mood, and so a lot of times people with epilepsy do need to see a psychiatrist at some point. Social workers can be really helpful to help with um, with insurance issues, with transition issues, um, different, different care coordination um, topics. And then other therapists may be at, involved at some point, occupational therapy, um, physical therapy, speech therapy. Nurse practitioners are typically a huge part of our practice, and they help with all aspects of epilepsy care. Um, neurosurgeons may become involved if, if there's um, a surgical issue in, in, your, in your child with epilepsy. And then dietitians really pay, play a major role in things like ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, um, some of the alternative um, options for, for treatment of epilepsy. 
Um, so tips to prepare for your visit. Keep a log of events, monitor compliance, bring details about family history, things that we've all touched on before. But bring a list of questions and concerns. That's going to be really important. These, um, these visits are oftentimes rushed. They fly by. And you may forget to bring up things that you're really concerned about um, or that you have questions about. So bringing a list of, of questions just kind of helps trigger and remind you. Um, bringing your medication bottles can be helpful. A lot of times medications are adjusted in ERs or with various different providers, and so keeping track of what dosage um, your child is on can be, can be tough sometimes. Um, so that's helpful. And then look at your abortive, so like your diastat will have an expiration date right on it, um, and, and try to keep track of when does it expire, is the dose correct, because as your child grows, that dose may change. Um, and then maintain a folder, like I mentioned before. So what happens when medications don't work? Um, that, we refer to that as drug-resistant epilepsy, and that's defined as seizures that continue to happen despite a good trial of two or more well-chosen medications. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about why do we define it as, as that. Um, so the likelihood of response, if we, take, if we take a lot of people with new-onset epilepsy, um, and we look and we start a new medication, how likely are they to respond to that medication and become seizure-free with that medication? And based on studies that have been done, about two-thirds will have their seizures controlled with one or more medications. So that leaves about a third of patients with new-onset um, epilepsy who continue to have seizures despite our medications. And that's the group that we need to start thinking about alternative options for. So there are a couple of studies that have been published, and I'm just going to highlight two, that looked at the effectiveness of the first anti-epileptic drug. Um, and so this one was um, published by Quan and Brody in 2001. And this looked at almost 500 patients with a new diagnosis of epilepsy who'd never been treated before. And it followed them over time. Only 10% of these were children. Okay, so this was a, a very wide range of different people. But what they found in that study is that um, the likelihood of becoming seizure-free with a first well-chosen medication was at almost 50%. It was about 50%, okay? And then after subsequent medications were tried, then the likelihood of becoming seizure-free for at least one year was about 64%. So that's where our two-thirds comes from. Um, and what we know is that after somebody continues to have seizures despite the first well-chosen medication, the likelihood that they'll respond to subsequent medication drops off. They published a, a follow-up study in 2018 that looked at 30 years of data, um, and it included 1,700 patients, almost 1,800 patients with newly diagnosed un untreated epilepsy. And they found very similar rates. Um, so about 50% were seizure-free with the first medication. After the first medication failed, the likelihood of responding to a second medication dropped down to about 12%. And then from there, only with your third and fourth and fifth medication, less than 5% of people become seizure-free. And so that's where we get the definition of medically refractory epilepsy. Um, once you failed two or more medications based on data like this, we know that the likelihood of becoming seizure-free with subsequent medications is less than 5%. So those are the people that, um, that we have to think about other things for. So how do we evaluate people with drug-resistant epilepsy? First thing we want to know, is the diagnosis correct? There are so many imitators of seizures. Not everything that looks like a seizure is a seizure. Um, so, this, so to help sort out, is this actually you know, syncope? Are these fainting spells? Um, are these migraine-related symptoms? Are these non-epileptic spells? Um, this will involve workup in, in an EMU type, an epilepsy monitoring um, unit type setting, to try to capture and characterize these spells to say, you know, are these actually seizures? Are these, you know, are these this type of seizures that we thought they were? And are our medications correct? We've also got to think about compliance. So in teenagers with chronic medical conditions, whether it's diabetes, whether it's epilepsy, whatever it may be, um, in the teenage years, a lot of times in that, in that um, 
in that quest for independence, they start to play around with their medications and test limits and see, do I really need this medication? And if they've been controlled on medication for a number of years, they may try going a couple days without to see what happens. And so, um, and we don't always know that. You don't always know that as parents. And so I'm really trying to get to the bottom of, was this breakthrough seizure related to a medication non adherence issue? Or was this related to, you know, the medication just failed? That can be, that can be tough to, to sort out. But trying to get that information is important. I had mentioned capturing and characterizing these spells on overnight EEG. Are we right about the diagnosis? Do we have the correct type of seizure? Are we targeting it with the right kind of medicine? Um, and so at that point, reevaluating medication choices. Um, and this is where you may want to seek another opinion. Ask two, three, four different people. Um, you know, we, I think as a provider myself, in patients who are not well controlled, I encourage them to go elsewhere. Somebody else may have seen something that I haven't seen, and they may have a different perspective on that. And so I would encourage you to go to other places, get other opinions, um, and, and see what other people think, um, because that may help. Um, and so an epileptologist is somebody who has extra training or extra experience with people with epilepsy. Um, and, and so those are often, if your child's seizures are not well controlled within about a year, of diagnosis, then that's often the type of person who you may want to get another opinion from. Um, a comprehensive epilepsy center is, is a center that has epileptologists and has extra support for people um, with epilepsy there, so they may have a whole list of other providers, and they may be able to provide specialized care, things like ketogenic diet, things like epilepsy surgeries, different things like that. Um, so what are some other tests that we may do in the cases of drug-resistant epilepsy? So we may repeat the MRI, make sure was the initial MRI correct, was, are there any new findings? We may recommend genetic testing to try to figure out it, what the specific cause of the seizures is. Um, PET scans, spec scans, MEG scans, we'll talk about what are those. They're not commonly used in most people with epilepsy, but in people with um, drug-resistant epilepsy, they're more common. So this is just going to be some basics about what is genetic testing, what does this mean? So genes, the basic gist, genes carry information that determine who we are. So they carry information about traits, about our eye color, our hair color, different, different things, our risk for seizures. Genes are passed to you from your parents, and each cell in the body contains thousands of genes. They're grouped together on little pieces of, um, of spaghetti-like material called chromosomes, which are shown here. Um, and these, so each human has 23 matching pairs of chromosomes and they get one of each set from each parent, okay? And so on each of these chromosomes, there are hundreds to thousands of different genes. So each gene has a special job. They make, um, they make different proteins. They have different functions in the body. And when those genes are changed, whether a portion of it is, is mutated, is changed, or it's duplicated, it's doubled, or part of it's deleted, or it's not being expressed properly, then something can go wrong with the function of that gene. And so, in some cases, problems with genes may cause a risk for seizures. There are a lot of different things that can happen with genes um, that can cause seizures, a lot of different things. Um, so how can genetic testing help? Number one, it can help us confirm a specific diagnosis. It can tell us about what else to watch out for. So sometimes in kids who have epilepsy, um, related to a specific genetic condition, sometimes they may be at risk for other neurologic or other systemic issues. And so knowing about those things helps us, it helps us with surveillance. Um, it may help with medication treatment or selection, and I'm gonna give you guys an example of that on the next slide. Um, and it may help limit unnecessary testing. If we know a cause, then we may not have to keep repeating the MRI every single year to see that something change. Um, and it may also help assist us in understanding what to expect in the future. What is the prognosis? What have other kids with the same mutation, what did their course look like? So one example is um, GLUT1 deficiency, so glucose transporter type 1 deficiency. So this presents most often with early onset, uh, early onset absent seizures, and they can be really tough to treat. The child often has developmental delays, sometimes they may have movement disorders, sometimes they may have multiple seizure types. The presentation can be variable. 
But when we identify this, what happens in this condition is that the body cannot take glucose from the, from the periphery, from the blood, and transport it into the brain. So what, if, what essentially happens is that the brain is not receiving the adequate energy source, and that's what causes all of these symptoms to happen. And so if we identify that, then we know that these children are uniquely res responsive to the ketogenic diet, so where medications may not help, ketogenic diet can make them seizure-free. And so knowing the specific genetic condition can help steer us towards therapies that, you know, that we may not think of first or another. So how is genetic testing done? Blood or saliva tests most commonly. And, and there are possible outcomes, and this, this can be confusing and frustrating. So pathogenic mutation means we found a change in a gene that can cause epilepsy, and we think that this is the cause of your child's epilepsy. That's, that's one outcome. A variant of unknown significant is probably the most common outcome. And what this means is that we see a change, and we don't know what it means. So it's, it's either not been described in the literature before, we don't know how that mutation may be affecting that gene product, um, we're just not sure yet. We don't have all the information yet. And so sometimes when that a, a variant of unknown significance comes up, sometimes we request blood samples from parents, sometimes other family members who may have similar symptoms, um, and sometimes we have to kind of revisit that with genetics a couple different times and over time, the literature changes, more cases are reported, and then that variant is reclassified. We could also have a negative test. Doesn't mean that your child doesn't have epilepsy, it just means that in the genes that we looked at, we didn't see changes. A PET scan um, is, it stands for positron emission tomography test. And what that is, is that's a test that looks at, most commonly, your brain's use of sugar, okay? So what happens during this test is that your child often has an EEG on because we want to know, is the child seizing at the time of the test? We hope not. Usually we do inter ictal PET scan. Um, and so this, what happens with this study is your child is injected with a radioactive substance, and then we do a scan. And what we're looking for with this is parts of the brain that don't use glucose well. Oops. So here's an example of a PET scan. Um, so on... Here in B, this is the MRI. The MRI looks normal, okay? Um, but when we look at the PET scan, so this is a functional study about how the brain uses glucose, we see we're looking for symmetry from side to side. And you can see down here in the left temporal lobe, it's darker. So that means it's not, it's not effectively using glucose very well, that portion of the brain. And that gives us a clue, maybe that part of the brain is sick. Maybe that part of the brain is not functioning well. And so if that matches with the symptoms or the semiology of how the seizure looks, how the seizure starts, um, if that matches with the EEG, even in the setting of a normal MRI, it raises our suspicion that something is wrong with that part of the brain. A SPECT scan um, is, is not commonly used um, in children. It's, it's really center dependent, honestly, what resources they have, what scan capabilities they have. Um, so some, some centers use this a lot more than others. But what this scan is, is this is a scan that measures the blood flow, relative blood flow to different regions of the brain. And, so, and they do it twice. So they do one scan at the time that the seizure starts. They inject the child within seconds of the seizure starting. And then they do another scan in between seizures. And they compare those two studies to see where is the blood going at the time that the seizure is starting? Where is most of the blood flow going? And that corresponds with the seizure onset zone. So these have to be done in an epilepsy monitoring unit. There's again an injection of a small radioactive tracer, and it's within, it's gotta be within seconds of the seizure start. Um, and, then, and then they do the scan, and then they combine the images. So this is what this scan looks like. So this is an example of a SPECT scan in a 15-year-old who has intractable seizures. And so the, the tracer was given within five seconds of the seizure start. And A, so on the left-hand side, um, this is the ictal scan. So this is when she's actively having the seizure that the tracer was injected. And then this is interictal between seizures. So these are two different scans, and they're comparing them. And what you see is that during the ictal scan, here, in the left frontal region, there's increased blood flow. And so, um, so that tells you, and between seizures, there's relative decreased blood flow. So that tells us that the seizure onset zone is somewhere there. 
Um, a meg is also not very commonly used, um, but basically what this is is this um, is most commonly used when the MRI and the EEG don't tell us the same thing, or when we're really having trouble localizing where exactly are the seizures starting. And so what this does is this measures small electrical currents that, um, that are arising from inside of the neurons in the brain. And so it can be used to see different locations of certain brain functions, and it can also be used to see areas of the brain that may generate seizures. So this is an example of a MEG scan and how it looks, and it looks complicated. But basically, in this, in this case, what happened was the MRI showed a lesion on the left side of the brain. But the EEG showed that the seizure onset zone looked like it was from the right side of the brain. The PET showed both sides had some abnormalities. So then, then we weren't really sure what to do. This is from Cleveland Clinic. Um, and so they did a MEG scan, and with that MEG scan, they helped to localize where were most of the epileptiform discharges coming from. So this is kind of like to confirm where are most of these abnormal signals coming from. Um, and, and based on that, so they found, oops, they found a cluster of spikes right here. And so based on that, they repeated the MRI and they did really thin slices through that area and they found, oh, there is a lesion there. And then from that, they were able to go in and resect <laughs> that lesion and the patient became seizure free. So sometimes MEG is used, sometimes it can help, um, but it's a, it's a really specialized test. So once a patient has refractory epilepsy, how can we treat it? What can we do? What are our options? Um, so epilepsy surgery um, is, is a potential option. Epilepsy surgery scares people. Um, it, you know, it involves an invasive brain surgery. I understand that. It's, it's a scary thing. There are many different types of surgeries um, that can be done. Some are potentially curative, some are palliative. Okay, meaning palliative meaning with the purpose of reducing seizures, but not necessarily curing. So when do we think about epilepsy surgery? Um, we think about it if there's a specific lesion that we can see in the brain, um, if, if we know that all of the seizures are coming from one specific part of the brain, um, if those seizures are occurring in an area that's not critical for things like speech or movement or vision or some of our vital functions, then we think about could we go in and resect that lesion because the options are you keep trying medications and you have less than a 5% chance of being seizure free or you could potentially be cured if we get that lesion out. Those, so that's why we start thinking about epilepsy surgery as an option. As time has progressed, we're, getting, we're coming up with you know, less and less invasive options, so things like laser therapies, um, a stereotactic, uh, a stereotactic radio surgery to help um, precisely um, target radiation to certain parts of the brain. So these are less invasive options to do some more things. Um, one example, one of the most common resective surgeries that we do is a temporal lobectomy. So in a patient who has seizures coming from one temporal lobe, just one side, um, and, and we know that every single seizure is coming from that area, then we think about are they, are they um, a potential candidate for temporal lobectomy. And this is the one of the, one of the most successful um, seizure, uh, epilepsy surgery types because up to 70% of, of patients who have this type of surgery um, with just focal onset seizures from that one temporal region can become seizure free. So if you think about it, up to 70% of these really refractory kids may be able to become seizure free with this surgical procedure. So yes, there is a risk to it. Um, you know, it's nothing, nobody wants to think about epilepsy surgery for their child, but it's a potential that we could cure them. Um, and so that's why, that's why we start thinking about it. Um, they may need to remain on medications. Um, even if they don't become seizure free, most people who have this procedure um, have a significant reduction in their seizure frequency. Um, but rates vary depending on each, each case is different. Um, and so depending on where the lesion is, what region of the brain, um, you know, it, rates really vary about outcomes. So then there are other palliative options. So by palliative, again, I mean that these typically are not curative. 
but in people who have a lot of very severe refractory seizures, especially seizures with full body jerking, the generalized tonic-clonic seizures, or the atonic seizures where kids are having very frequent falls, this is something that we can offer um, to try to reduce the frequency of those seizures. And so what this essentially is, is there's a tissue bridge between the two halves of the brain called the corpus callosum. And so the surgeon goes in and, and cuts a portion or all of that tissue bridge. And what that essentially does is that prevents the seizure from being able to spread to the opposite side of the brain. And so you have less severe seizure symptoms. And so what we've seen is that um, the outcomes are about, um, two, in two thirds of people, there's about a 50% seizure reduction. So again, it's not a cure, but in people who are having very frequent atonic or generalized tonic clonic seizures, this may be an option that may help improve their quality of life. This is just one study, this is outcome data from Children's Hospital of Michigan that was published by some of my colleagues, and this looked at 20 patients who had 20 um, children who had corpus callosotomies done, um, and what they found in their outcome data was that about 85% of patients had at least a 50% seizure reduction. And this, this, they looked at multiple different seizure types as well. Um, so other options, vagus nerve stimulator. So maybe your child has refractory epilepsy, but they're not a candidate for a focal resection. Um, they're not a candidate for corpus callosotomy. Vagus nerve stimulator um, is a great potential option. So what this is, is this is a device that sits in the chest. It's about this big in general. Um, and, and then a lead is tunneled under the skin up to the neck, and it wraps around the vagus nerve. And it sends little impulses of electricity um, to the vagus nerve, and that helps, we think, change the neurotransmitters in the brain over time to help prevent seizures from happening. Um, and typically, when it's, when it's functioning properly, a person with the device is typically not aware that, that it's even operating, or they may have just a little bit of, of a buzzing feeling, um, a little bit of hoarseness in their voice when it, when it goes off. This is, again, what it looks like. And when you come to the office, we can change the setting. So this is a wand, and this is a tablet. And we can use this. We put it right over the chest. We can use it to check, is that vagus nerve stimulator working properly? We can change the settings. We can adjust things based on seizure control. And, and what we see, the outcome data, um, based on different um, clinical studies, is that, um, that the efficacy improves over time. So by about 10 years, um, seizures decreased by about 50% in probably about 75% um, of patients. So, um, so the outcome is good. Um, responsive neurostimulation is another option that's just recently started being used in children. So this was FDA approved in 2013. It's still just approved for adults, so people 18 and older, but they have done some cases down to six years of age, I think is the youngest child that, has, that this has been done on. And what this is, is this is a neat little device. It, it is a brain surgery, and, and when they do it, they implant little electrodes here into the parts of the brain where the seizure starts, okay? And so the, this is sometimes used in kids who have a seizure onset zone in an eloquent area, meaning that the place where the seizure starts is a place maybe that's responsible for motor function or some other vital function. Um, and so what you can do is you can put this little strip, this little electrode <coughs> in that part of the brain, and it actually gets EEG data continuously and so if it detects, if the device detects that a seizure is starting, then it can give a little impulse of electricity to try to stop the seizure. Um, and so again, settings can be adjusted over time. Seizure frequency can be tracked by this machine itself. Um, and the average decrease in seizures improves over time. Um, and so about two thirds of people with this RNS have their seizures at least cut in half after seven years of using it. So again, not curative, not curative, but, but can reduce the frequency of seizures. And, and you may be able to um, decrease medications in some cases. You may be able to go to lower doses. Um, so it can be helpful. Ketogenic diet is another great option. Um, so on the top is a pie chart of the typical American diet. The yellow is carbohydrates. So we eat a lot of carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are in things like pastas, breads, things like that. 
Um, and in ketogenic diet, the thought behind it is that it's very high fat and um, low protein and even lower carbohydrates. So this is your typical ketogenic diet right here. Um, so almost exclusively fat. So this is a lot of butter. This is a lot of oil. This is a lot of mayonnaise. This is, um, you know, things like that. And so, and really no breads, no pastas, just about none. Um, sugary things, ice cream, no. Um, and so you may hear things like um, the ratios for ketogenic diet, four to one or three to one. And what, that, what that's referring to is that for every three or four grams of fat, there's, um, the child gets one gram of carbohydrate and protein combined. So it's a really restrictive diet. There are modifications. So modified Atkins diet, for example, um, allows you to have more protein and a little bit more carbohydrate. So that's easier to do. Um, but this can be very effective for some kids, and like we talked about, for GLUT1 deficiency, this is treatment of choice. What's the youngest age you see keto? Babies, sometimes babies, yeah. Um, so this does require close oversight um, by trained dietitians, um, and there are a lot of different things that we have to watch out for. So we have to watch that, um, that they're getting proper nutrition, because if you think no sugar, that we really have to limit certain fruits, certain vegetables, certain sources of, um, of good vegetables. Um, we have to really keep track of portion sizes. Um, and, and there are side effects. So there are things like constipation, kidney stones, high cholesterol. All these things can happen, increased risk for fractures um, and slowed growth. So we have to keep track of all these things. Um, but in many cases, it can reduce seizures by at least 50%. Um, in about 50% of kids, and in some kids, it, it makes them seizure-free. So you asked about age. We use this um, commonly in kids with infantile spasms, and those can start, you know, six months of age, younger even sometimes, and this can be really effective for them. And in fact, it's easier for babies because they have a formula, so they don't have to think about eating, you know, all this butter and... Um, a specific formula. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are different keto formulas. Um, that you can start for, for young babies, um, which makes it easier. Um, so a summary of what we've talked about so far, we talked about diagnosis, we talked about follow-up visits, treatment options, refractory epilepsy. Now we're just gonna touch a little bit on barriers. Um, so we know what is, what is good care, why is that disruptive? So communication, geographic barriers, insurance challenges, physician-patient relationships, these can all play a role. So communication, sometimes there are language barriers. So in those cases, most offices will have some type of translating service available. Um, so ask at the time of scheduling about that, make sure that, that that's clear. Set expectations early. So figure out from your provider, when should you call? Um, you know, if my child has another seizure, who should I call? What is my emergency plan? Do you have somebody on call? And most often, they do, there is somebody available on call, you just may not know who to call um, to get that person. Um, patient portal, I can't emphasize this enough, is a great tool as well, because if you're thinking of a question in the middle of the night, you know, you can just email it, and usually within the next business day, somebody will be able to answer your question. So it's a really convenient <coughs> thing. Um, you know, some people work during the day, during typical office hours, when your doctor can most likely call you, you're at work, you can't answer the phone, and so then patient portal, other type of um, options can be important. Um, if you're often changing your phone number, try to have multiple phone numbers in the chart so that we can contact at least some family member who can get a hold of you if that's an issue for you. Um, other family members, um, you can sign consents that can be in the chart so that we can speak with other family members who may be caring for your child and get to know the nurse working with the practice because a lot of times, like I said before, they're your first line um, contact. Geographic barriers, so you may live really far away from your doctor. What can you do in those cases? Some places are starting to offer telemedicine where you can just meet with your doctor over a screen. Um, sometimes you can set up your follow-up interval further apart. So, you know, your, your doctor may typically see epilepsy patients every six months. If your child is well controlled and you live two hours away, talking over the phone might be okay. You know, touching base over the phone, setting something up like that, just, just be open and, and talk to your provider about that because a lot of people are open to that. 
um, know your visit grace period time. So again, if you live two hours away and you get stuck in traffic, you may have very little control over what time you actually arrive there. So call us as soon as you know that there's an issue. Sometimes we can even swap appointment times, put you in somebody else's slot, things like that, um, to try to accommodate you. Um, typically, our office is scheduled every 30 minutes, and so we have a 15-minute grace period. But realistically, what that means is that if you arrive at, let's say, 1.15 for a 1 o'clock appointment, by the time you register, you get your vitals done, all that stuff, you're probably not in the room ready to be seen until your appointment time is over. And so I know grace periods are frustrating for you guys, but that's why they're there, to try to respect everybody's time for the next patients, too. Um, also, ask about accommodations for families who live far away. So there are Ronald McDonald House charities um, available in some locations for people who live far away so that you can come the night before your appointment and, and stay there. And typically, they're not very expensive. Um, and I think in Detroit, it's about $10 a night, and your whole family can come study. Um, and a lot of insurance companies provide transportation and different things like that. So call your insurance company to try to get an understanding about those benefits. Um, insurance challenges are real. Um, so um, testing can have very high co-pays. Neuropsych testing or genetic testing may just not be covered at all. Um, and so... And so call ahead um, to your insurance company. Typically, we try to, prior off, we try to do prior <coughs> authorizations for most testing. Um, but, um, but if that doesn't work, um, then you can call ahead and you can talk to your insurance company as well about what's covered, what your expected co-pays will be. Um, and we can, we can rearrange things too to try to get things covered. Um, prescription costs can be very high, and so there are prescription copay cards, there are drug assistance programs through some of the insurance companies, um, and so look for those types of things, and then, um, and then try to choose your insurance plan based on your preferred network of providers. There are also secondary insurance options, so I'm coming to the end now. But Children's Special Health Care Services is, um, is a service through Michigan Health and Human Services. And their goal is to help you get, help your child with special health care needs get the care that they need. So they can help with care coordination, they can help with educational resources, they can help with coverage and referrals to, to specific providers that you may need to help support your child with special needs. This is a great organization. There is a fee, but the fee is waived for children with Medicaid, my child, um, and it's not an income-based service. So anybody with, with these special needs may qualify. And their contact information is here. Um, Physician-patient relationships. So everybody has different personalities. All I can say about that is try to match yourself with a provider who you can talk to openly because um, this is going to be a several-year relationship probably. And so you want to feel comfortable with the person who you're working with. Um, be open, be honest. You know, If something's not working, try to talk it out, try to talk about why. But don't be afraid to seek a second opinion from elsewhere. Um, that's, that's fine to do. And then talk early about your goals and expectations. So if you have a child who is more, um, is, is globally delayed, has a lot of special care needs, and, is, and your interests are more palliative for that child, make sure your provider knows that. Because we don't, you know, our, like I started the presentation, our goal is control seizures no seizures, no side effects. But in some people, that's not realistic. And so in some people, if your goals are different, if your goals are, um, you know, allow them to have three seizures a day and, and we don't want them sleeping all day, then, you know, we can meet you there. We can, we can talk to you about that. But you just, you just have to tell us what your goals are. And we'll try to bring that up as well. And then advocate for your child and family. Don't be afraid to speak up, ask questions, bring lists of questions. Um, and then the Epilepsy Foundation um, has so many different resources. They can send nurse educators to your school to teach your school about how to give diastat, how to, you know, how to carry out the seizure action plan. Um, they have so many different educational resources. They have camps that kids with epilepsy absolutely love. Um, they have so many different options um, and, and ways to help you. So that's all I have. Any questions? Dr. Weber. I have some questions. 
Oh, and I just do, you mentioned children's special health care services. Just wanted to direct your attention over to Lisa over here, who's with the Family Center with Children's Special Health Care Center, or services. So uh, be sure to check out that table when you get a chance. Hey, who's got a question? Um, you were talking about, um, oh, never mind that, I can't remember what exactly, but, but do they tend to have a higher percentage of bumping into things or being considered clumsy, spelling, breaking things? I'm, I'm not sure. Children with epilepsy, you mean? Children with epilepsy, do they have a higher percentage of being clumsy or bumping into things? They may, you may see fine motor deficits, you may see, let me step here. So you may see fine motor deficits, you may see deficits with coordination. Part of it, I think, is determined by what the cause of epilepsy is. So epilepsy can be caused by so many different things. Some kids definitely have physical limitations. And with like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy specifically, there people may drop things or knock things over because of the, the seizures. myoclonic seizures yeah. even, yeah. Other questions? That's right. Dizziness for medications. Mm -hmm. Yep. And some of our medications definitely affect coordination. That's there's yeah. Hi. Um, what kinds of of epilepsy diagnosis do you typically see the GLUT one um, disease in? What type of seizures? Uh, seizures, yeah. Yeah. So the most common is early onset absent seizures. So kids who, you know, classically described as kids who start having absent seizures, the brief staring generalized seizures, starting like at six months of age, which is really unusual. That's young for absent seizures to start. But they can have all different types of seizures. And so they may not have absent seizures. They may actually just have movement disorders. When they go to exercise, they may just have funny movements that they can't control, that are involuntary, that are not seizures at all, but that may be the only manifestation of, of the disorder. So it's really variable. And the more genetic testing we do, the more we realize that we don't really know much about this. So there's a whole spectrum of what can happen with different gene changes. Um, and I, as we're doing more testing, we're learning more about that. You said that the, um, the, the uh, folic acid is important as a supplement in the teenage girls. Mm -hmm. Is it because of any medications that are depleting it, or is it just... Mm -hmm. So I, some I, medications um, some medications do, and some medications carry a higher risk for neural tube defects. So that's really what we're targeting with the folic acid, is preventing things like spina bifida, anencephaly, things like that. And certain medications do <coughs> carry a higher risk. Um, and so in the teenage population, we try to avoid those medications. Um, that we know have more risk for causing birth defects, but in some cases you can't, you know, um, so do what you can. With the GLUT1, um, mm -hmm. do you know what gene like, that's on, like it's, what chromosome? I can't remember right now off the top of my head. Okay. I'll have to look it up. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. My child just has a chromosomal abnormality, so I was wondering if maybe that was already on that gene that we already have issues with. Got it. I'll tell you by the end, I'm not thinking right now. We were talking, you were talking earlier about lesions. I was just wondering, can a lesion be created, I guess, from a traumatic brain injury? Can that be a result of a traumatic brain injury? So the lesion would be found like on an MRI or a CT scan? Okay. Lesion is a non-specific term. It just means that we see something there. So that can be a lesion, can be a mass, a lesion can be a scar, a lesion can be an old area that was bleeding. Okay. It's just a non-specific term. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm new to this whole thing, so. Great. Thank you. No, thanks That's for asking. That's yeah, yeah great. Can you touch on ES, ES, and how and why the brain like just the seizures change and morph into different kinds of seizures and. Yeah, so ESES is electrical status epilepticus and slow wave sleep. There are a lot of different names for it. CSWS is another way that it's referred to. But what that is, is um, it can present in a lot of different ways. But essentially what happens is that when the child goes to sleep, the electrical activity in the brain, um, basically the brain is trying to continuously make a seizure. So we see very, very, very frequent spikes during sleep. 
Some kids you see frequent seizures, but some kids you may not see seizures. And so what we think is happening is that during that, that time of rest, the brain is so active trying to make seizures that it's not able to carry out its other functions. And so typically what happens, what we see clinically, is a decline in school performance. So, um, so the child's not able to learn. We may see significant behavior difficulties. Um, we may see a lot of personality changes, things like that. And, and so having that EEG information is important and trying to suppress those spikes can be important too to help improve those, those types of things. And it's normal for it just to come and go and... I don't, I don't know. There's no such thing as normal. No. That That's a good answer. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, can I, I don't... Can you talk a little bit about the, the treatment of ESES, the, the actual um, electrical status of lepticus as opposed to the seizures and how that's different from treating the seizures? Yeah, so typically we use high doses of either seizure medication, sometimes things like clobazam or Onfi. Sometimes we use um, steroids, sometimes we use IVIG. There have been case reports of Depakote. Um, some people use high dose diazepam. So there are a lot of different treatment options with the end goal being to try to suppress that pattern. We also know that in kids who have ESES, sometimes that can be made worse by certain seizure medications. So things like oxcarbazepine or trileptal can actually make that pattern worse. So those are medications that we know to try to avoid in those circumstances. Um, can RNS and VNS be used simultaneously with the patient? And the second part, different question, is do you know when the internasal midazolam that's been recently at the approved will be in the prepared available to the public? Did they not know? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think any of us know. It but, is at the not approved. available. Okay. Yep. Just like there was the same question with epidiolex. When, when yeah. CBD became available or that epidiolex, it was approved, but then there was a several month lag period before it was actually clinically available. Yeah. We've heard mumblings of fall, but, but, but I don't know. That's confirmed. I don't remember the answer to that. I've never seen a patient with both implanted. I don't know the answer. Maybe somebody else here does. Do you know? Hi, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes you can. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I've, heard, I've heard that. It, and typically what will happen is someone will already have a VNS, and then they'll go to be evaluated for an RNS, and they keep both of them. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, I guess we will go ahead and wrap this up. and. Uh, we're going to take a break, uh, but let's uh, again give Dr. Weber a round of applause. Yeah, so um, she'll be around during the break. So if, if anyone wants to come up and ask any questions directly to her, you, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we're going to reconvene at 10:30 for our next presentation. So uh, thanks again. <laughs>